Good afternoon. It is Monday, April 23rd, and today is Daily Bit 87. We are, again, a cryptocurrency and blockchain newsletter delivering you updates on the market, insights on the market, Monday through Friday in the morning, and here we do our video recap of the articles and kind of dive into stuff a little more. I can, I can kind of go about and juggle some ideas that I have on my head in the market about each particular story. So, again, uh, thanks for joining us, and... Just a disclaimer, just running through everything, this isn't financial advice, this is just me talking through the events that we wrote about in the paper today and how I'm kind of looking at things and how I think you guys might want to look at things and how to kind of evaluate the market and, and just kind of have that macro outlook here. So again, if you want to subscribe to our newsletter, if you like what we're doing, share it with your friends, tell them to subscribe if they want to kind of keep up to date. I, I think we do a decent job and our readers seem to like it as well, but again, just go to our website and subscribe if you want to. And again, quick table of contents. We have Mail It In, Crypto Is Back, for Where's Blockchain, No Time to Waste, Bulls and Bears, The Amazing Race to Interoperable IoT, for our bear, it's Grab Your Stakes, it's Picketing Time, and for Education, we're going to look at the Byzantine Fault Tolerance. All right, Tweet of the Day is coming from Dan Bilzerian. So Bilzerian here is saying that it's time to get back into crypto. Well, if he's been around in the market, like Crypto Bitlord and myself and others kind of following the space day to day, the time to get into the market was four weeks ago when things were actually bottomed out and a lot of these cryptos and digital assets were in their accumulation phase on the chart. So right now we've, we're seeing a lot of altcoins spring up 60, 70 percent, even in the hundreds of percentiles or uh, percentages here in, in the past couple of days and weeks even. So again, if you crypto is back to the masses, but if you were actually monitoring the space, there's there's been kind of an uptick here for a while now so that really comes to show how important it is to keep track of what's going on but again we're gonna look into that right now so again is crypto back there's a lot of people that are wondering if we're back in this bull market and if we're out of this downtrend right now and again the best time to get in was four weeks ago the best time to start positioning yourself in and, and buying those bottoms and buying those floors was way back when and and we have seen this huge increase in market cap there's been an 80 there's been an 80 billion dollar injection since last week so I mean again a huge capital inflow but again that's pretty standard for this volatile market and if you look at what's going on here there's, there's a lot of moving parts always and again you can't kinda own in on one area and say this is attributing to all this growth and all this stuff too but if you wanna actually look at what happened at least this weekend and, and we did and kinda figured all right, what's happening here number one Circle doubled their minimum ticket size for OTC trading orders from 250k to 500k. So, when you look at that, these this is clearly catering to these larger players that can't go to these exchanges due to number one custodial risk, and number two, there's going to be way too much slippage if you're putting in these orders for 500k, upwards of millions and millions of dollars. These exchanges, the books are just too thin to handle this, and that's really going to change their order price when they actually want to execute their buy orders or sell orders. So again, there's larger players getting involved here. OTC trading desks are getting a lot of volume, even though centralized exchanges such as Coinbase and Gemini, uh, Huobi, uh, Binance, Bithum, they're, they're, the trading volume might be low there, but again, behind the scenes in these dark pools is where there are larger buyers stepping in. On top of that, number two, the buy market's percentage has surpassed 90%. The last time, we'll, we'll take a look at what that actually looks like on the next screen, on the next slide, but Basically, the last time that happened was in March 2017, and for those who aren't aware, Bitcoin was trading in the range of around $1,100 in March 2017, and that's really arguably what started the bull run that led through all of 2017 up to 1920k before we've had this kind of three-month pullback in, in recent times, starting in January. So again, just looking at historicals, that's another suggestion that we might kind of be, there, there's kind of an appetite for buys in the market. Number three, the Lightning Network is maturing. Peter Todd is a cryptocurrency consultant. He has a large influence on Twitter, over 100,000 followers. So clearly a big name going on here. Peter tested the Lightning Network in, I believe, February, and he found some faults in it, realized that it wasn't working as great as it could have. There was definitely some problems with the user interface. He recently tweeted the other day that that has improved. He tried to do a transaction and went through successfully, instantaneously, no problems, no qualms with anything. So again, the user interface is improving. And on top of that, the code base underneath the lot underlying the Lightning Network is maturing. So again, this could be a potential solution for Bitcoin as a second layer scaling solution, which again would lead to off-chain transactions and allowing for 
again, increased volume within these actual blocks and allowing for a, a different scaling solution than Bitcoin Cash and increased block sizes. Number four, Saxo Investment Bank is bullish, at least one of the analysts at the bank. So in their, in their second quarter report, the head crypto analyst for Saxo Bank suggested or, or predicted that he personally believes that we're going to be coming out of this downtrend because... Number one, there's a lot of anybody with weak hands has been shaken out of this volatility, and it could be due to just either investing too much to start and kind of sweating bullets because of that, or number two, just not used to the volatility. So again, it's, it's a blend of reasons. It could be due to tax season and a bunch of this stuff, like we mentioned the other week. But along with that, anybody who's still in the market is really hungry for any bullish news. So anything that comes out that's suggesting that something is going to be kind of on the up and out, people are going to be putting in buy orders. And again, if this was happening in February, similar news, it wouldn't really have the same effect because we were still really bleeding out here and the market really was shedding billions of dollars by the day. So again, I think times have changed and clearly Saxo Bank thinks as well. Ask any other people in the market. And on top of that, the fifth note that really came out this weekend, it, this is just my opinion here, just scrolling through articles to see what, what's going on here. The media is getting aggressive, very aggressive, in my opinion, with their headlines. There was... An article that came out, I believe, from Money Morning that said, this is your, basically something along the lines of, this is your 2013 time to, this. if you haven't profited or didn't profit in 2013 for Bitcoin, this is the second coming of that. And you can profit and achieve, basically they suggested that you can achieve the same profits right now as you could in 2013 with Bitcoin, which... When you look at the returns, it they you had preposterous returns in 2013. So you have to think, who's reading that? And what kind of impact does that have? A lot of people are gullible, and a lot of people just don't even read into stories. They'll read headlines. So the fact that the media has such... They can really kind of swing the audience and swing people's opinions simply with a title. So the fact that people are in, in articles are throwing out these titles that are very suggestive about the movement of the market just shows that, number one, a lot of people are going to be buying into this, and number two, they're certainly not the only ones that are doing that. So again, I think that there's just kind of a consensus within the media that this may not be kind of a capitulation that we were seeing in January, and we're actually towards a recovery. But again, the bottom line, rising tides will raise all ships, except for the ones that are battered and peppered with holes. So when you look at this again, there's there's kind of been, uh, I guess, a little bit of a consolidation with funds into more legitimate projects. We've weeded out a couple scams, RIP BitConnect, RIP Centra. There, there's there's more coming, and especially as securities or, or projects are being called out for not labeling themselves and identifying themselves as security tokens, we're going to see more of this. But again, you have to identify what your investment strategy is. Do you want to be conservative, moderate, or aggressive? in terms of how much risk you want to bear. And on top of that, what projects do you want? And that's going to impact what type of investments and what type of digital assets you want to invest in. Do you want to take the top 20 and create a basket of those? Or are you willing to, or are you trying to hunt it? Are you trying to hunt for the next Bitcoin or a smaller micro cap investment that is going to appreciate much larger due to the fact that their, mic their market cap is so small? So again, this is what we're looking at, and if you think that the market is back and you want to make an investment, seek a financial advisor, because we certainly do not give financial advice. We just report on what's going on in the market. All right, moving on. Oh, yes, so the buy market's percentage. Again, this is an index or a piece of information. If you want to get the actual link for this, please check our newsletter. It's on Medium. It's on our website, and you can find out what this actually looks at. But again, last time this happened, March 2017, big bull run. Similarly... And it's end of 2018 started to creep up, and the prices creeped up concurrently. So again, if this is a good indicator, this could suggest we're going to see something. And again, bull market or bull trap. Not that many votes. We're still cranking up our Twitter following. But again, is it a bull trap? It could be. Uh, in 2014, April, it sure was. So again, we'll see what happens here. Just don't kind of believe the hype. Just kind of, you have to think for yourself and see what's going on. Where is blockchain? So this company is Swatchcoin. Before we dive into that, when, when you're throwing stuff out and you're in your house or you're, you're walking around the street, the only incentive you have to throw stuff into a, to throw plastics into a plastic bin and metal into a metal bin is, number one, your moral judgment and what, how, how moral you're feeling that particular day. And on top of that, the writing on the actual lid. If it's just a general bin, you're, you're probably just going to dunk it in there and call it a day. You're not going to hold on to your trash and look for another bin. So again, there's... 
There's no incentive, in other words, to deposit trash into the appropriate bin for recycling. So again, this this company, Swashcoin, it's looking at how they can revolutionize waste management by implementing crypt crypto economic incentives or incentives that kind of rely upon or call upon a crypto economic system using tokens. So what does that mean? It means that basically for households and institutions that are recycling, they're looking to reward those that follow the rules and play by the rules and recycle appropriately and send this re send these recyclables to waste management waste management or waste processing facilities which then convert these goods into waste I, I guess recyclable products and then sell those to buyers in the market that want to purchase these goods so again the idea here is that they're going to be creating a cocktail of technology that calls upon IOT tech adaptive intelligence and big data in order to produce efficiencies in the process of waste management which if you check their medium page it's super inefficient right now there's a bunch of articles talking about the waste management that is deployed in all these countries around the world third world countries second world first world whatever it is there there's it's a clunky process right now and there's not really much of this advanced technology involved and again it's all about changing the business model around how we look at humanitarian efforts to improve waste management and, and kind of fix the planet and, and make sure that people are recycling and people are taking care of the of their goods and and of earth so again we're not backing swash coin by all means quite frankly we just read their medium page or i just read their medium page and and saw what's going on right now so if you want to take a look at the project by all means do so this isn't an endorsement it's really just looking at how far and how profound some of these applications are going to be with with this new business model that we're seeing here with with crypto economics and really decentralizing that trust and decentralizing and well not decentralizing but unlocking that additional social and and um and human value not human value but unlocking that additional capital and that value that's kind of hidden and not really extractable from centralized companies that just monetize information and data and again this is just the outline of what's going on here households to institutions to people and then the exchange is kind of there in the middle, just making sure that funds flow around together. What else should you read today? Preston Barclay, he is a lawyer, Georgetown undergrad, GU graduate. He wrote a Medium article highlighting the advantages of ICL issuances and regulatory hurdles that's going on and potential solutions through specifically the Jobs Act and how that could potentially save ICOs. If you want to take a look at this and the actual legality, read Preston's article. Very, very helpful. New podcast alert. Beep, 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 beep. Crypto Titans. There's a ton of podcasts that I also read, or, or not read, listen to, by the, by the way. And I'm going to write a Medium article eventually, once I do kind of have 30 minutes of my time, to just let you guys know about those. But again, if you want information on podcasts and just kind of want something to listen to related to crypto, check out Crypto Titans. Strategies, background, thought processes of industry leaders, definitely pretty helpful. Low-cost transactions are here, folks. If you wanted to know, Litecoin, recent, well, a transaction with Litecoin amounting to $99 million was successfully completed the other day. It cleared in 2.5 minutes, and it only cost $0.40 cents in fees. So compare that to the traditional process. The traditional settling process right now for a security, if you complete the actual exchange up front, that's only a promise that you're going to receive the currency or the security in the future, and that could take a couple of days to weeks in order to get that into your hands. This takes two and a half minutes and it costs 40 cents. This is this is the direction that we're heading in right now with tokenized securities and digital assets. Pretty pretty straightforward there. The Delhi High Court is seeking a response from the Reserve Bank of India following a plea challenging their blanket ban on digital currencies for all banks and institutions within India. So again, the Reserve Bank of India, it's due to the risk that this, their ban with for banks and institutions interacting with Bitcoin and other digital assets stems from number one the fact that it's a huge risk to investors that don't know what they're doing and just think that they're going to get rich quick and number two there's a lot of risks on top of that with hacks poor custodial issues security breaches and and just all that stuff when you decentralize again this trust you're offloading a lot of that a lot of that risk that banks manage and you're putting it onto the consumer and the user and expecting them to kind of know how to navigate that system that's one of the things that is deterring adoption in the space as well so again Delhi High Court says, look, you got sued, or a complaint came in from one of these companies saying that that's not fair. 
please give us a response. Tell us why you did it. It's not necessarily bullish. It's not necessarily bearish. It's just saying that, look, the, the high court is responding, and they're going to ultimately come to a decision. So, I mean, we'll just keep on tune with that and see what's going on. The one is attracting investments amid tensions between the U.S. and Russia. Quite frankly, I haven't read into the actual U.S.-Russia debacles. But, again, it's becoming more of a safe haven investment amid all of this tension between these two countries. So, again, the ruble and the U.S. dollar kind of have maybe a little bit of outflow there into the yuan because it's going to be a better hedge for what could be potential macroeconomic, political, geopolitical risk coming up, coming forward. On top of that, China is not going to allow digital assets in the country to circulate in the country. They're only going to allow the crypto yuan Honestly, really don't think anyone should be surprised about this because they're already having issues with they already have issues with capital outflow. So again, why would they allow Bitcoin to circulate in their country when it is able to kind of circumvent their current economic system and, and their current uh, I guess financial system and risk additional outflow of capital and, and just not allowing the country the country to control funds. Makes sense. John Williams is expected to be the next head of the New York Fed. He came out, I believe, Friday or Saturday of the past week, announcing that Bitcoin doesn't meet doesn't meet the requirements of a currency. Again, nobody's really surprised. Nobody's really surprised by this right now. Bitcoin does have properties that make it more advantageous than gold, but at the same time, it's still pretty volatile. And again, the transaction fees are making it not conducive for micro. Actually, I take that back. Um, it's getting more conducive for for micropayments and microtransactions, but again, if you're looking at all three properties of of currencies, Bitcoin really doesn't come off the par right now. So again, we have to remember that, look at the internet in the 90s, it took years for that to happen. So Bitcoin has really come out, I mean, it's been around for nine years, but again, if we really want to make this right and make this work, it's going to take time. So again, let's circle back in five years, 10 years, and see where we are. I really, I, I am very, very confident that that answer is going to change in the future. If not for Bitcoin, then something else. <clears throat> Bulls and bears, the amazing race to interoperable IoT. So, interoper interoperable IoT, that means digital assets can communicate with each other. They can be, all digital assets are recorded on the blockchain. Your cell phone is recorded on the blockchain. What do you mean is recorded on the blockchain? Everything, every digital asset, every digital good can be recorded on a distributed ledger. So how does that happen? You need to have an identification system for everything. So how do you get an identification system for every single thing? You need some cor you need some sort of a watermark or some some mechanism to kind of tag these items. And in order for that to happen, you need a blockchain to rely upon and you need technology to rely upon as well. So that usually comes through the form of partnerships. You have a blockchain platform, and a lot of these blockchains are competing to be the top dog and number one here, but in order to do that, they need to find these partnerships with these really top-notch organizations that are deploying this innovative technology in digital identification to, again, make that feasible, make that possible, allow for these use cases to kind of uh, materialize and allow them to expedite the rate of adoption for for real world users right now again speculative assets not really much of use for your average Joe VeChain is a platform that is looking to become the IOT cane and they partnered with INPI Asia they're an innovator with digital ID solutions and again they created this new form of digital ID called ND codes it incorporates nanotechnology into their products and this essentially allows for all these new products to be registered on a blockchain. So again, IBM, we talked about, I believe it was their, what was that called? They have, IBM's creating their mini computers that essentially acts as this smart chip that you can embed into products. And again, it's, it's similar, it's a similar tracking technology that allows you to kind of, again, create this mesh, this network of IoT devices. But again, there's a lot of advantages over on, about these ND codes over the current monopoly that sits with coding. Hold on. Okay, right. So the today's today's digital ID market. Right now there's really three main players. There's radio frequency identification, RFID, near field communication, NFC, and QR codes. I personally only have dealt with NR with QR codes. I feel like most folks have done the same. But again, these are really the top dogs. But ND codes change the game for a number of reasons. Number one, 
hide in security with fanatics. They're temperature resistant. You can have these puppies put on devices. They can withstand temperatures of a thousand degrees. So again, think of temperature. Think of machinery that heats up. They won't be broken. They won't be damaged. If they are damaged, they can withstand up to 30% of damage code, and you can track them and identify them in the dark. They're okay with moisture. They're okay with electromagnetics. They're very, very tiny, and they can fit on curved surfaces. So again, what actual products can we fit them on? And they last over 100 years. So again, there's a lot of advantages here compared to the current types of digital IDs. And what are the applications here? Again, you can put them on any product, and more specifically, it provides a means of auditing inventory and auditing all, all of these all of these accounts. So again, if you wanted to incorporate some anti-fraud, this is a way to do it. And again, it, for industries like fine art and fine art collectibles, any alternative assets that are actually very high in valuation and have very large instances and occasions of fraud, and where fraud is very pervasive, you can use this technology to make sure that everything is authentic and reliable. And at the same time, this sounds very, very startlingly similar to George Orwell's 1984, where we live in this dystopian society where everything is kind of monitored and tracked. But again, that's where the cryptography comes in, where, again, we're really just tracking everything, and everybody is able to, users are able to retain privacy, and the only people that actually have that information are the ones involved in the actual transaction. So, sigh relief, don't really have to worry about that. Okay, so WikiLeaks is very famous, Julian Assange, very famous for good and bad reasons, depending upon what side of the argument that you're on, but basically Coinbase, so WikiLeaks has an e-commerce site called, it may be called WikiLeaks Shop, but that's that's besides the point. Their shop was previously or currently, well, previously integrated with Coinbase, and Coinbase just announced that they blocked WikiLeaks Shop from using their platform, and they said that they don't meet their terms and agreements, yada, 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 whatever the point is. Coinbase, WikiLeaks is pissed, and they want to do a boycott of Coinbase. They called upon the crypto community saying, got to boycott Coinbase. They're exerting this undue influence over the industry, the fact that they're a centralized company, and they're able to basically pick and choose who they want to do business with is not great. It's it's damaging the industry. There, there's a number of reasons, and there's, again, people that approve of this, people that don't approve of this. But if you want to do a time hop, and just see where this is kind of coming along, coming along and ties in. BitPay did something similar in 2018 in February, where they updated their T's and C's and they prohibited selective activities. And this is really going towards more Silk Roadish dark market territory. So again, depending upon if you're uh, more of the libertarian libertarian mindset, where you think that's okay, your body, uh, your decisions, it's really up to you. No harm, no foul with other people. It's again, it, it really depends what mode of thought you subscribe to, but Again, there's going to be people that say yes and say no to all this. And if we're looking at there and back again, more of that time hop stick. WikiLeaks in 2010, when there was a ban on financial institutions donating to WikiLeaks, WikiLeaks said, hey, look, we'll accept Bitcoin. And that was kind of at the point where Bitcoin was really like in the dark in the corner. Nobody really knew what Bitcoin was, except for folks that, again, were using it for the dark markets, which, again, if you're looking at technology in the past, fraudulent and bad actors were really the first ones to actually use this tech to begin with always so again the situation has really come full circle here where again it's um, nobody wants uh, or, or coinbase isn't permitting wikileaks to use their service and bitcoin is again in bitcoin again is involved in the big picture but this time it's a little different there's more currencies available thousands actually hundreds eh, yeah 1.5 thousand but there, there's a good amount there's a good amount and there's more services available than Coinbase. So, again, they're not really between a rock and a hard place. But, again, this is just WikiLeaks eh, probably making, a, in my opinion, maybe too much of a big deal out of it. But, again, it's still a big deal when you look at the fact that if you want to have these... Uh, if you want to have this freedom of uh, and this ability to transact freely. But, at the same time, if you, you don't have to use Coinbase. You can just use another... You can use another, I don't know, you can use another service. But at the bottom line, the way I'm looking at this, companies are becoming more compliant with policies and they have to subscribe to these old legacy systems policies because that's what's really going on. You're not going to reinvent the wheel here and kind of overthrow these current systems. You, you're you seeing these companies fall into, kind of, kind of fall into line with these regulations. And as that happens, I feel like there's going to be a gravitation towards, towards restricting 
organizations that are kind of controversial because if you don't, you're basically telling Uncle Sam to F off and any regulators, you're kind of spitting on their feet after all they've done for you. I mean, Coinbase doesn't want to get shut down. They don't want to get fined, slapped on the wrist. So, I mean, again, is it surprising? Not really. We should really expect this at this point. So, again, just, just kind of think about why it's going on here. It's not because they... I mean, I mean, it's an agenda that's certainly being pushed, but, I mean, maybe it's not really there. They may not have any decision here. I mean, this is kind of the price to pay. All right, education. Byzantine fault tolerance. So I'm sure a ton of you guys have heard about this before, but the idea here is that thousands of years ago, in, in this hypothetical scenario, Byzantine generals are circulating this, or surrounding a city, and they want to lay siege to that city. But in order to do so, they have to make sure that each of their factions of their army Attack at the same time, they have to, if they want to attack at sunset, they have to attack at sunset. If they want to attack when somebody shouts, um, s sends out a bugle, they have to do it at the same time. It, it's They have to make sure they attack all at the same time, or else they're going to be defeated by this city. How do they do that? They have to make sure that there's communication between all of the divisions. How do they do that? They don't have cell phones. They can't tweet. They can't set up a conference call. They need to have a messenger go through the city and actually relay this message on a note or some other form of communication and on top of that they have to make sure that the generals have to make sure that the information is trustworthy when it comes to them so the messenger could be abducted they could drop the message it could be read by officials and it could be sent back over to these generals tampered with there's there's a lot of things that could go wrong here so again they have to find a way to make sure that this information is trustworthy. So they have to reach a consensus amongst the generals that everything is going to be ship shape and ready for battle. The application for this in cryptographic networks is called the again, it's it's the business it's Byzantine fault tolerance. And the idea here is you're calling upon a group of generals, i.e. validators, nodes, computers in the network, to confirm that the information delivered to them is authentic. Is trustworthy. It's it's actually reliable in the system. So there's two spin-offs of this from what I from what I found in my research. And again, there could be more. There there's a lot going on. This industry is rapidly moving. Practical Byzantine fault tolerance. That's under 20 validators or so to determine consensus in the system. Hyperledger Fabric employs this type of consensus. If you want to look into more of this, we have this linked in our article in, in the actual newsletter. So again, check out Medium. Check out our website. Subscribe if you want to find out, or Federated Byzantine Agreement. So again, each node, in turn, they're responsible for their line of truth and, and kind of establishing truth for each chain that, that's kind of, that they're responsible for. So again, where does this, where do we see this ripple, which, where the nodes and, and uh, generals, I guess you could say, are pre-selected by ripple, and with Stellar, where it could really be any node and it's up to you to rely upon, or to determine who you want to trust here. And what are the perks? Low transaction costs, high throughput, network scalability, cons, centralized, well, centralized and permission. So again, this goes back to the, I guess, blockchain trilemma that Vitalik Buterin talks about, where you really can only have two of the three. Uh, good grades, sleep, and social life. It's it's the college kind of metaphor for, or I guess, scenario for for blockchains. So. Again, what do you want? Um, right now, apparently, or I guess so it seems that mo most folks agree that business fall tolerance is one of the best options out there. I mean, Stellar is hugely popular. Ripple is hugely popular. And Hyperledger is, and again, another very popular form of privatized blockchains that is looking into this type of consensus algorithm. So again, I, I'd say that maybe the top, definitely within the top five is uh, Byzantine fall tolerance alongside proof of work and proof of stake. But again, we are very early on. If you look back at last year, most people that are kind of involved in crypto, myself included, did not know anything about this. So we'll see what happens as time goes on. And that's it again for another edition of the Daily Bit. Guys, thank you again. Appreciate it as always. I appreciate you guys listening to this. I hope this is valuable. Again, if you have any comments, if you have any suggestions, if you want to get involved and maybe come on and just... Just uh, chatter with me as, as I kind of go through this, and I want to hear your thoughts. Please let me know. Send me an email, hello at thedailybit.news. Shoot me a tweet, thedailybit.news. Follow us on LinkedIn. Send us a comment right on our wall. 
Don't know if you can actually do that. But if anyway, still, please, comment on our Medium post. Tell us what you think. I'm going to be putting out a couple things, just sharing my resources, because I'm reading through a lot of blogs, a lot of articles that I don't think are really out there yet. Early, well, they are out there yet, but they're not publicized. And I, it's, I've learned a ton in these past couple weeks alone, just from the research that I'm reading. That I'm reading. So again, super helpful for me. I'm sure it's going to be great for you guys too. And I'm trying to deploy that in my conversations with you guys through this Skype, not Skype, through Twitch. So again, thanks so much. And please, again, keep tuning in, keep spreading the word, and we will get back to you guys tomorrow with more stuff. All right, thanks and cheers. Bye.